precious blood stains. You all don't know how much this song means to me, especially in the last month and a half. I had knee surgery the 8th of August, and believe me, it, the first two weeks was bad, bad. I, I, don't, I don't like pain in the first place. I'm not a sickly person, never have been. I just, I, I don't know how to be sick, put it that way. I don't know how to be sick. But I had my husband sit right beside me, helping me with my exercises. And I mean, I purely cried. It hurt so bad. He said, you'll make it through. Don't worry about it. You'll make it through. And if it hadn't been for him, I don't know if I'd have made it through or not, tell you the truth. But I told Brother Myers, he t I talked to him on the phone, and I, t I told him, I said, I'm glad I only have two knees because a third one wouldn't have got done. <laughs> Guaranteed. But I thank the Lord and praise him. He's brought me this far. Brother Steve's coming around this morning, getting ready to share our morning uh, memory verse. Give Brother Steve a hand. Some of you don't know I'm a plumber, so um, full time for Jesus also. But I, I went over to her the first time, me and uh, Brother Eric, my son, we fixed a hose bib that was leaking. And um, at that time, I think Sister, Sister Myers has been working on her. She's a friend of hers. And uh, she talked real highly of, of Sister Myers. You know, they work together and everything. And... Uh, just felt like that was a little opportunity. I, I know she's been working on her a little bit, but, um, you know, I witnessed to her the first time, you know, invited her to church, and, um, you know, today's the day, you know, don't wait around. So the other day, I, I went back over to her new place um, and fixed something else for her, and again, you know, I'm like a broken record, I guess, sometimes. But, you know, that's what we got to do. We got to be persistent. You know, if you're working on your neighbor or your uh, family member, you know, don't don't give up, you know, because God will give you the words and uh, he'll give you the strength to say whatever has to be said. You know, it might be six months from now, you know, it might be a year. But, you know, sometimes I can remember back when I had backslid and people had witnessed to me and, and said, hey, you know, do you, do you know the Lord? In the back of my mind, you know, I'm thinking very well I know the Lord, you know. And those times that people had said that to me kind of just jolted me, you know, in other words. So what you say to people, they're not going to always not. They might blow you off one day, you know, but one time they're going to need the Lord and they're going to remember what you say to them. So um, this week's scripture I just want to say that I love God. So this week's scripture is Romans chapter 8. And it says, There is therefore now no condemnations to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Romans 8 and 1. Write that down. There is therefore now no condemnation condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walks not after the flesh but after the spirit praise the Lord are you ready for the word of God this morning hallelujah you have your Bibles this morning, get ready. Let's look into what God has to say to us.
If you missed Thursday night, uh, you missed a wonderful service, as I mentioned earlier. The Lord really moved here. And uh, I always encourage people, especially since we stream our services, if you miss anything, go back, watch it, listen to it. Uh, there are different people that's, that uh, don't have as good of a connection for whatever reason or as much data. You can also, while you're working, you can listen to messages. I have a lady that messaged us the other day. I've never met her before. She found us on the Internet, and she said every single day she gets on our Spreaker broadcast, which is the audio because she can put the thing in her ear, and she can actually work and listen to the services while she's working. So you can do the same thing. You can do the very same thing. Uh, This morning, I desire your prayers. I don't normally uh, say too much, but uh, this morning, I've had a real bad headache today. My neck's killing me, and my eyes feel like they're crossed for some reason. So, you ever had that brain fog feeling? Uh, Some of y'all look at me like, are you kidding? I've been dealing with that all my life. Praise the Lord. We're going to try to look into God's Word to see what the Lord will say to us here today. We're going to turn to the book of John, chapter 4. Now, this is a very familiar text. John chapter 4, and we're going to turn to uh, verse number 3. And while you're turning there, I want to say I love all of you and appreciate all of your attendance and faithfulness to the house of the Lord. God has brought us all together for such a time as this. And I believe God can really help us right here today. John chapter number 4, and we're going to read verse 3 through verse number 7. And uh, when, you, when you have it, if you will, say amen. All right, John 4, verse number 3. If you're watching online, God bless you. Stay tuned a little while. Maybe the Lord will speak something into your spirit you need to hear. The Bible says here, And he left Judea and to, departed again into Galilee. Now I want you to look at verse number 4, and I want you to read this with me out loud. And he must needs go through Samaria. Read that one more time. And he must needs go through Samaria. Verse 5 said, Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. Then cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. The Lord has directed me to this particular text, and I know we've heard it preached from countless times, but this is where we're going to take from verse number 4 that said, And he must needs go through Samaria. With the Lord's help, I'm going to preach this morning on must needs. Raise your hand to the Lord and ask God to have his way. Lord God, this morning we're thankful for the privilege to be able to share the Word of God with one another. The Word of God is the bread of life, everyday life. We pray, God, that we'll be able to break this bread this morning that every ear and heart can receive. I'm praying, God, that the words that I speak will become life to the hearer, to be received, to be applied. I pray, God, that there'll be those that hear the message today that will be forever impacted and affected by the word of God, and everyone can say amen. I pray this morning this message will just speak directly to you. But I'd like to talk to you this morning on the subject of must needs. There's no doubt several people that are most likely here today that feel as though that you try to be there for everybody else. But for whatever reason, in the times that you need somebody, there you are, all by yourself. Have you ever felt that way before? If you're one of those people, you're a giver, you're a doer, and you're all the time doing for somebody else. It's a painful thing whenever you somebody calls you and you'll run and go help them if they need help. And every time that they need a little money or something, you're there to help them a little with that. Or maybe you're there, you're the kind of person that whenever someone's down, as they say, I hate to use the term luck, but they're down on their luck, and you call them up. Hey, how you doing? What's going on? Hey, man, I'm praying for you, you know. But then when you go through those difficult times of your life for whatever reason, you find yourself in a position where that 
nobody's really there for you. I know sometimes that if we're not careful, we'll, we'll be involved in self-pity and we'll feel sorry for ourselves when we really shouldn't. But the truth is that there are some of you that are here this morning, you know exactly what I mean. You're a doer, you're a giver, you're a helper. Then there you are, you're in a time of need of your own life and you look around you and you feel lonely. You feel like there's nobody really there to encourage you, nobody to lift you up. If somebody else was going through what you're going through, there's a good chance you have already called them on the phone and said, hey, look, I just want you to know I'm praying for you. Hey, can I help you with anything? Is there anything I can do? You need your grass mowed. And that's the way some of us are this morning. We're helpers, we're doers, we're givers. And maybe not all can say that, maybe not all can testify to that because somebody's got to be guilty of the not doing or not returning the favor. Sometimes I find that with people that it's not necessarily that that, uh, that they're not one to return the favor. Sometimes people get busy and they don't even realize through the busyness and hustle and bustle of everyday life what their brother or sister's going through. Sometimes we can expect somebody else. They just, we just take it for granted. They know what we're going through. They know that we're in pain. They, they know we're in a struggle. And, and whether it's that or whether they just, you know, they're nonchalant, carefree, and don't care what you're going through, either way, there's a time of your life that you feel empty and you feel void and you feel like there's nobody really there to lift you up when you need to be lifted up. When I read this story about this woman at the well, She's a very synonymous woman in the Word of God. Most all of us have heard her story. Probably no doubt nobody that's here that's never heard about her. Probably all of us have heard about this woman at the well who left her water pot at the well side. But there's something that, about this story that I think that you and I can gain for our own personal everyday life. When we look at the text from the very beginning, Jesus is going into Jerusalem from Galilee. And I want you to understand that as he leaves Jeru- or Galilee and heads to Jerusalem, for him to get there, most commentaries will tell you that he's got to pass through Samaria. It's a given. He's got to go through this area. And so uh, one of even, even one of the greatest commentators that I use a lot of times for my own personal study made the comment that the reason that Jesus went through Samaria and it was alone on this simple fact was just because that was the road to get there. You see, there was only one road that you could take to get from Galilee to Jerusalem, and that was through Samaria. But as I began to stop and think and pray about this and just kind of meditate on the the, the idea of it, I have a hard time believing that Jesus, when he said, the Bible said he must needs go through Samaria, that it was just because that was the only road. Yeah, let me explain what I mean by that. You know, some of you that have ever traveled up through Georgia, you've ever gone that direction. I know that Brother John has. They headed up many, many times. I talked to him and said, where are you headed? We're headed up so-and-so. But if, if 95 was the only road to get to Georgia, if, if Interstate 95 was the only road to get to Georgia and you're talking to your friends and man, I'm headed up to Georgia. Is that right? Yeah, and I must go through Jacksonville. Does that make sense? I mean, there's other places along the way. There might be a little side street there and here. But if you make an emphasis, then you say, I've got to go through this certain place. There's a reason that you're going to put emphasis on because otherwise you're stating the obvious. Uh, yeah, of course you got to go through Samaria. That's the only road to get there. No, I'm, I'm, I've got to go through this place. And so I, I'm of the mind to believe this morning that Jesus must needs go through Samaria because there was somebody there that had necessity in her life. I want you to understand that the place that this woman is at in her life is a representation of, a, of where I've seen a lot of other people at. She's in a place of necessity in her life. She needs something. Here's a woman that if we read on in the story that we find that she's been married several different times or at least she's been shacked up with somebody several times. We don't really know, but when we understand it sounds as though she's been married several different times. At least four or five times this woman's been married and the one you're with is not your own name. Now. It's what Jesus is coming across. This woman has been through several different relationship situations. 
Now, of just my common knowledge of everyday living, I've counseled with a lot of people. I've dealt with a lot of people as a pastor in just everyday life kind of thing. And I've found that people that go through multiple relationships like this, they don't go through these things without some sort of scars in their life, without this affecting them in several different ways. I, when we marry people, if you understand when people get married, you ever see how the, they'll take the two sands and they pour two sands together? You ever seen that? When, whenever some people get married, there's a tradition among some, whether they'll take a plate in the Jewish belief and tradition, when you take that plate, when you get married, you crack, you break that plate. And when it breaks into many different shards of pieces of plate, the idea behind that, the idea behind the sand is once these two things are joined, that sand, for you to go back and try somehow to separate all of that sand is nearly impossible. In other words, that person that you marry, that person that becomes a part of your life forever, even if you get them out of your life and you move on and go to another person, somehow or another, that per especially if you have children, that person has made an indentation in your life that will forevermore be there. As there some of you that maybe have been married in the past, and even though you're you're not in love with that person anymore even though you're not with them anymore if you found out they got in a car wreck and they died you would probably be sad to know that because somehow they have affected your life whether you understand that or not and this woman, she has been impacted by the things that she has gone through. She's been affected by the things that she has dealt with in life, and life has dealt her. When I look at this woman, I have to imagine that this is a woman that potentially has levels of insecurity in her life. A lot of the women and a lot, even some of the men that I've come in contact with, when they battle through relationships and you go from one relationship to another, a lot of times there is a level of insecurity within your own self. You look in the mirror and you think to yourself, what exactly is wrong with me? Am I talking to anybody this morning? What exactly is my problem? What's wrong with me? I don't understand. I, am I ugly? Is there something wrong with my personality? Is there something something wrong with me in general that I cannot find somebody that will really treat me like I deserve to be treated. Somebody that will love me with all of their heart. And so there's levels of insecurity. And what I find is that when they go to the next relationship, even though they're not married to him anymore, they treat the next person like they're still married to the last person because of the levels of insecurity that they have. Where well, the last husband may have beat you to death. And this husband may never do that sort of thing but you're always insecure wondering is he going to do the same thing to me the last husband he cheated on me and you're always worried will this one do that to me is he going to leave me is he going to cheat on me is he going to do this thing to me and you have insecurities that you deal with and you begin to battle with these things because simply put there are levels of insecurities that are developed through the trials and the adversities that you face has anybody been in there say amen. This is a woman who has got emotional effects in her life of what she has been through. She has to wonder who really does love her. You see, there are, there, I hate to say this, uh, but for some women, there are areas of their life that they feel like the only reason that a man wants anything to do with them is for what they have to offer behind closed doors. If you don't love me in any other area, Hey man, can I tell you this morning, if a man's only attracted to you physically and that's all there is, let me tell you, when you get wrinkles and you get gray hair and you can't walk like you used to and you don't have the same body you used to have, hey man, it ain't gonna, come on somebody, it ain't gonna work out well in the long run. But if you find a man who will love you for who you are, it does not matter when the wrinkles come, they're gonna look at you and say I love you anyway.
Come on now. I told my wife here a while back. I said, you know, I'm kind of getting a little thin on the top. This medicine that I take, it causes your hair to fall out. And it might even be some genes in there that make it even worse. I don't know. But I said, I'm kind of, you know, I don't care who you are. There are certain, I guess there's some people maybe don't. But when you start losing your hair or you start getting wrinkled up or you start getting gray and all that or white, you start thinking to yourself, man I hope they're still going to really be in here with me I still hope they love me wrinkles and all and I told my wife I said it bothers me you know my hairs are falling out and uh, she said honey I don't care if it all falls out I'm here with you I love you you know why because that is true love it doesn't matter if I got to go get a toupee or a wig or whatever else Uh, now I can tell you sister Myers will love me bald but if I put a toupee on there might be some problems in the parsonage Uh, and I don't blame her there. Amen. But all jokes aside, amen, here is a woman uh, who has faced all sorts of emotional ups and downs of life. Uh, Like many of you that are here this morning, uh, a problematic past, uh, a woman that's got necessity, a woman uh, who that she has to wonder, do they love me for what I have to offer? Even the very day that she goes down and finds Jesus sitting on Jacob's well, she finds uh, him and a man sitting here who she finds out later is Jesus Christ. Uh, she's there at the well to do something for somebody else. Uh, she's the water girl. She's there to take care of everybody back at home. Uh, and I've got to wonder, does the man she's with really understand what kind of woman that he has? Uh, him and the kind that will take care of the needs of the man she is with with uh, but sometimes wonder does anybody care about my needs uh, oh I begin to feel like preaching here now amen does anybody else care about the pain that I go through uh, I hate to tell you this uh, but sometimes we are terrible at being listeners uh, sometimes you have somebody that comes to you and they say I'm hurting uh, and you say oh God I'm hurting in my back too I'm about to die I almost fell over getting out of the car this this morning uh, and they tried to tell you I need somebody to talk to and you spent the next 30 minutes telling them how bad your life was. Uh, you know sometimes people don't need an answer they're not looking for you to tell you how to fix it. They just need somebody to listen to somebody to pour out on uh, somebody to understand hey uh, you got but listen I got needs too. Uh, I got some things going on in my life uh, hey man can I tell you she went through four or five different men uh, and could not quite find it doesn't seem uh, one that would really care one that really understood uh, but on that day at Jacob's well she met a man uh, who cared about her needs Uh, somebody say thank God for that Uh, when I began to think about Jesus he is traveling down that road his disciples are going into the city to go get some meat it's about 12 o'clock in the day the sun's beating straight overhead it's the hottest part of the day just about it here's Jesus uh, he passes through that little place uh, and while his disciples go out he must needs go through because there's somebody there necessity brought him to the well say what you want to he might have had to go through that road uh, to get to Jerusalem uh, but he had a plan sister Amanda he could have went with the disciples Uh, he could have went with them to get meat uh, but he had a plan Uh, I'm glad that God got there before she ever even did and I tell somebody you might have had to wait on a lot of folks Uh, you might have had to wait on a lot of things Uh, but you're serving a God this morning that can get there long before you ever do Uh, he's sitting there on the well side Uh, like that gospel song that says uh, he's still waiting by the well Uh, hey come on now there's some of you Uh, you tried everything you tried to find your peace in the bottom of a bottle you tried to try find that tranquility in a pill form Uh, you tried to find it in another relationship Uh, but Pastor Myers came to tell you when you find the master you'll be patient enough to wait on the right one Uh, there are some of you uh, if you're not careful you'll be so persistent that you gotta have somebody you're gonna end up with the wrong one Uh, you 
find you, come on, I don't know why I feel like saying this, find you somebody with a heart after God and you'll find you somebody with a greater chance to succeed in marriage and relationship. Necessity brought him to the well. It brought him to a place with a woman with needs in her life. Loneliness will make you get with somebody you really shouldn't be with. It never ceases to amaze me. I have seen people that were beautiful and be with Jack Rabbit Johnny. Come on now. Because they're desperate. I'll take any Joe Blow that'll take me. <laughs> I'm preaching to you. I'll take anybody that comes on. I just want somebody to tell me that I'm beautiful. I just want somebody to tell me that I'm important. I just need somebody to tell me that I'm of value because the last few jerks ain't done nothing but kick me to the curb and use me for everything they could get out of me. But I'm preaching to you this morning. uh, I know somebody that won't do you like that. Say, my God, I know somebody that won't do you like that. He is one that looks at your situation and he must needs to come to Gray Street. He must needs to come to the front door of your house to knock on the door. And he said, behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if any man will open that door, I will come in and I will sup with you. Say, man, somebody. I must needs to go to somebody who's emotionally in need. Somebody who has dealt with rejection. You know, sometimes rejection will make you feel like you need to take whoever will take you because I've been rejected so many times before and felt like I was unimportant, ill-equipped, didn't have what it took. Maybe I just need to take whoever will take my hand and say I do. She had already been down that road. This woman is proof that at least four to five times that this woman has already tried the same thing and it still hasn't seemed to be working for her. I run into people all the time that just keep doing the same stuff and it ain't working and you wonder why they keep doing it. They keep going back to that same drug house and you're wondering. They keep running back and it just blows my mind. They want to say, oh, I'm looking for me a good man. And every time you turn around, they'll be having a new status on Facebook and you look and you think, what in the world are they thinking? You set yourself up. Why you got to chase every bad boy in town? Huh? When you start putting your focus where it belongs, you see God began to change some things for you. But you're chasing the wrong things. And you've done it time and I don't know, I'm a boy, the Lord is talking to somebody here today. You've been chasing all the wrong things for all the wrong reasons. Uh, amen. What you've got to do at some point in your life, you've got to take an inventory and say, I've done a lot of things that have not worked out well. I might want to perk up, pay attention, and figure that I got to try something different this time. Come on now. When I was an evangelist several years ago, I remember there was a church service where Sister Pat Montgomery stood up and she said, Can I testify? I said, I'd love for you to testify. She jumped up on her feet. She stood up. She said, I want to tell this church before I gave my life to the Lord. I tried it in men and I couldn't find what I was looking for. I tried it in a pill bottle and I couldn't find what I was looking for. I tried it in getting a better job, making more money, having more stuff and I could not find what I was looking for. She said, everything I tried left me with no peace. I went to bed at night tears stains on my pillows uh, but I can tell you she said whenever I found Jesus at a well side she said my whole life turned around for the better and I tell you this morning uh, it might not mean that you're never going to have another trial and uh, never have another affliction uh, but I'd rather roll over and have him uh, amen as my alongside help uh, than somebody else is trying to bring me down uh, can I tell somebody uh, what you need more than anything is you need a meeting at the well side with a master uh, 
Come on, somebody. What you need is somebody that'll take your hand and show you what true love is. Hey, man, Brother Jack Clarity, who used to be a part of this church, he used to stand up and testify quite often. He said, folk, he said, you never know true love, the true love of life until you've known the love of God. You can tell somebody you love them. We got 11-year-old girls saying, I love this man. Let me tell you, what you need is go do your homework. You need to get back in school. You don't know what love is, young lady. Come on, somebody, you tell me whatever you want to. You ain't come too far enough to understand. But when you've taken hold of the greatest hand there ever was, that nail-scarred hand, husband, you want to know how to love your wife. Amen, and get involved and understand the love of Christ for the church. Amen, wife, you want to love your husband? Understand the love that Christ had for the church. Jesus told us in the word of God, he said that husbands to love your wives as what? As what? Christ loved the church. Jesus came out of necessity for a woman who had needs that nobody else could really see. We hide a lot of things behind our mask. We hide a lot of pain behind our mask. There are even people that come to church who come on Sunday morning and put on that religious mask when the reality is behind that mask there's hurt that you keep trying to table it trying to push it to the side but it just keeps coming back to the surface and instead of putting it on the altar instead of meeting him at the well side and letting him help and deal with whatever's going on inside well I don't want to trouble him I don't want to bother him you know I, that woman was a Samaritan she was a half breed person and in their day the Jews didn't have anything to do with somebody that was a mixed breed of person, if you will, mixed culture. Wouldn't have anything to do with them. And she's astonished, Sister Amanda, at the fact that this man sitting at the well, who is obviously a Jew, has taken the time to do what he's not technically supposed to do and others have not done. He's, he's having a conversation with her. You see, the reality is, Jesus asked this woman, I, I want to paint this picture clearly for you. Jesus asked this woman to give him something to drink. Under their day's laws and tradition, they didn't even drink out of the same cups. You want to talk about segregation. They wouldn't drink out of the same cup. But Jesus says, do you have anything to drink? She's blown away. You mean to tell me you really want something to do with me? For the last five jokers only wanted what I could offer them in the dark. But this one said, do you have anything to drink? I feel something in my spirit. I don't know what it is, but you're interested in something here. I want to know what it is, but I, I don't understand this conversation. Why are you having something to do with me? And I want to tell somebody here this morning, you may look at yourself in the mirror and you remember every sad story, every sorry thing you've done, every sinful thing. And there's things uh, that truth be told, uh, you wouldn't want us to put it on that board this morning and broadcast to the whole church stuff you've done stuff you've done under the rug stuff you've done behind the scenes you wouldn't want nobody to know what you've done in the dark Amen. but I know somebody who said I already know what you did and I still want to know I still want to talk to you I know that I, I know that others say that I shouldn't have anything to do with you but he wasn't just a Jew he was also the king of glory and the king of glory said I was traveling down this road little lady I was battling uh, amen the heat of the day the thirst in my body that I needed to quench uh, and when I finally got to this well I sat right here and I've been waiting on you the whole time uh, I've been waiting for a little while for you to show up and get here I came to tell somebody 
somebody this morning. Uh, the Lord's been waiting on you to make up your mind of what you really want. Uh, do you want to go back home to the last five? Uh, or will you really leave uh, your water pot on the well and take the whole well supply with you? He said, the water that I'm going to give you. He said, it'll be a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Uh, you know what he was saying? Uh, he said, hey, they can't give you what I'm going to give you because what they give you will run out. Some of you remember the story of Gomer and Hosea. One of the most beautiful stories of the mercy and the forgiveness of God written in the entire Bible. Beautiful story. And then this story, Gomer, she's the wife. But before she's ever Hosea's wife, she's a prostitute. She has made her living by selling her body to any man who would pay for her services. Strangely enough, God tells Hosea, I want you to go marry a wife of whoredoms. Some of you raise your eyebrow and go, God told her to, him to do what? Yeah, because God was about to illustrate a very valuable lesson to you and me and to the entire nation of Israel. Go marry a wife of whoredoms. And I'm just going to let you know, before you marry her, she ain't going to be faithful to you. Woo! What are you saying, Pastor Myers? Hosea was told by God to go marry a woman that he told him before he even married her, she ain't going to be faithful to you, but marry her. <laughs> Sister Kathy, he married her. He bore her, she bore him children. Each one of their names meant something. My Lord in heaven, I wish I had time to preach all of that out, but I don't have time, so I'm just going to tell you. There came a time. You see, Hosea was a man that didn't have a whole lot of means. Hosea was a man who worked hard, and he gave his wife everything that he could give her. But you see, here was a woman that had gotten used to having everything at her fingertips from all of her lovers. So when Hosea couldn't buy her the fancy perfume, and when Hosea could no longer give her the fancy place to live in that others could give her, the fancy clothing and the beautiful colors of purple and such of their day, she left him. She went right back into that lifestyle. And Sister Patricia, she got messed up with all of those fake lovers. And one day, God deals with Hosea to go down. And on this auction block, she's being auctioned off as a street prostitute slave. When she left... She might not have had the most expensive perfume, but she had bathed, and she smelt nice. When she left, she might not have had the most expensive clothes on, but she was well-dressed. When she left, her hair was attired and fixed, but today, that enemy out there had left her in such shape that she stands on the auction block of sin when I see her, I don't know if they had that kind of stuff back then, but if Jezebel would tell me anything, I would assume maybe so because of what the Bible records. But I picture her, Brother Steve, with mascara lines running down the sides of her face. Her hair, it looks like it's got grass or different weeds or what in it where she's slept on the ground. Her hair is all messy, oily, not fixed. Her clothes, some are somewhat partially torn. They have stains where she's worn them day after day after day, and they don't smell nice at all. When she walked out of the house, she walked out with her head up. But today, she walks or stands in shame. She stands in reproach and degradation. Hosea 
as he walks up on that auction scene, Brother John Henry, and he looks and he sees that woman who he loved that God instructed him to marry, who walked out and was unfaithful and bore children that weren't even his. When the hands and the bids started going up, who will take, who will give me, who will give me 50 cent as the crowd laughs? Who give me five dollars? Anybody give me five dollars? Somebody give me ten dollars? I don't know what their terms of money might have been, so I'm just going to use ours just to illustrate a point. Who give me twenty five dollars for this street whore? Who give me thirty dollars for this? She smells terrible, but she'll clean up nice. Who give me thirty dollars? But I want to tell you something. When nobody else would take her, Sister Linda, there was a hand in the back of the crowd that went up in that crowd and said, I know nobody else may have any stock in her. Nobody else may want her. But Hosea said, I'll take her. The very one that you walked out on, my God. The very one that you turned your back on. The very one that was not good enough when you wanted the things of the world. The very one that you turned your back on and walked out like it didn't matter anymore. Nonchalant, you could care less what he thought about it. Hey Amen, don't let the door hit you. I'm headed out of here. I've got others that'll show me attention. I've got a world out there that'll give me what I I won't. Uh, let me tell you this morning, if you're backslid on God, there ain't nobody that'll do you like Jesus. Uh, and Jesus used Hosea to paint a picture to the entire nation of Israel to let them know, listen, uh, when you walked out on me, you've turned your back on me. The Bible said that he's married to the backslider. Uh, come on, somebody, I begin to feel the Holy Ghost. Uh, he's married to the backslider. Uh, he's married to that one that's turned her back on him uh, and ran the other way. Uh, the one that's said, uh, the world's got everything I need, uh, but I wonder, is there any gomers here this morning uh, that said I was once a gomer, I walked out on him, uh, but I'm back, pastor, and I ain't going nowhere. Uh, Come on, somebody, the pleasures of sin may last for a season, but I take the house of God. Uh, I'll go back to my Hosea, and I'd rather have what he has uh, than all the pleasure of sin of this world. Raise your hand and give him praise right now. Come on, give him praise. Hold on. It was necessity. It was necessity that made Hosea walk up to that auction block. I want her. I want her back in my life. She has needs of her own. Let me explain to you the reason why that this is such a valuable thing this morning. Because most of the people that we will meet in this life only care about what you have to offer them. Now, I don't care. You get right down to it. You can tell me a whole lot of stuff. But the average person, most people you meet, they are only concerned about what you have to offer them. I heard a saying several years ago. It said some people come into your life for a season, some for a reason, and some for a lifetime. And I understand that we will walk in and out of lives and people will walk in and out of our life. But when you really care about somebody, I just believe that somehow it should be expressed and known by the longevity of that friendship one way or the other. I've got people here in this church that I've been knowing for many, many years The longevity of your faithfulness as a friend tells me a whole lot more than those who only wanted what I had to offer, that that I could help them move out of that apartment or that I could fix their car and then they didn't have anything to do with me. Do you understand? i got to wonder how God must feel because I've been pastoring this church for a while and I've had people that have gotten car wrecks stand up and tell the whole church, I'm going to serve God now. Going all the way. I mean, God's got my attention. Two months later, or less, nowhere to be found. Forgot totally what God did for them. But I want to tell you this morning, the God that you serve, he's not as concerned about what you have to offer him. He wants to know what he can do for you. Because he asked this woman, 
for a drink just to prove to her that he's willing to drink of the cup that other Jews wouldn't drink out of. But then he goes on to let her know, what I have will be in you a well supply springing up into everlasting life. In other words, Fred back at the house, he lose his job, and you get kicked out of a, a, apartment number six. You used to that, but what I have to offer you, it ain't gonna run out. It'll be there. When you go through adversity, and if you're laying in the hospital, eat up with cancer, he said, I have something for you. Fred will show up to the hospital when you lay in there sick and ask you when you're coming home to cook dinner. But the Lord said, don't worry about a thing. I got you taken care of. Matter of fact, let me bring you something. Come on, somebody. Because a lot of people in life, it's all about what can you do for me? What do you have to offer me? But I know somebody, it's not about what you have to offer as much as it is what he wants to do. He said, I'm gonna transform you by the renewing of your mind. Stand all across this house to your feet as I get ready and close. She was a woman that faced a lot of trust issues, rejection and discouragement. But just like her, Brother John, would you come to the piano this morning? Necessity brought Jesus to where she was at just like necessity brought Jesus into the furnace fire with the three Hebrew boys. Necessity brought Jesus to the home of Jairus where a 12-year-old girl laid dead. Necessity brought him to the tomb of Lazarus necessity brought him to the pool of Bethesda in closing let me tell you what I think amazes me about that particular story much like the woman with an issue of blood who had tried everything else and was none the better the Lord talks to this fellow who's laid at these porches in Bethesda. And this man says to Jesus, he says, every time that I try to get down to the pool, somebody else steps in front of me and I can't seem to get my help because something always happens. Something always stands in the way. You see, Jesus realizes that this man has no doubt wanted to get in the pool, but maybe he didn't understand how to get in the pool or how to get there fast enough. So necessity, the need to get a man where he couldn't get himself. Did you get that? Necessity to get a man where he could not get himself. There are those of you that are here this morning and you say, Pastor, I've tried about everything I can. I've tried to quit. I've, tried, I've got an addiction. I've got a habit. I've got a problem. I've tried to stop this cycle of defeat in my life. I've been trying. And the very thing, just like the man at the pool of Bethesda, necessity brought Jesus to the man's side to get him the help that he needed. And he didn't even have to put him in the pool. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed this morning. I want to give you a minute to think about what I've preached. He must, needs, go through Samaria. Your must, needs. I, I need him desperately right now. It is your needs that causes him to say, I must, needs, pass through Gray Street, Visit her, visit him in the altar. As heads are bowed and eyes are closed, I'm giving you an open altar call for everyone that feels the tugging of the Spirit of God on your heart. I encourage you right now to say, Lord, I need a touch of the Master's hand right now. I have family members, Pastor Myers, that need a touch.